Good, e good evening, everyone. Good evening, and thank you all for coming out on such a snowy, wintry... International Women's Day. March. Well, that's coming. <laughs> that's coming. And uh, uh, day to, to our latest uh, lecture in the CIUS seminar series. Uh, we are pleased to have with us this evening Daphna uh, Rachok on this special day, which as I'm sure you all know is International Women's Day. Daphna is a PhD student in anthropology at Indiana University in Bloomington. How's the weather there? What kind of a winter do you have? Oh, let's not talk about it now okay. when it's no, when so bad. <laughs> Less said the better. She completed an MA in Critical Gender Studies at Central European University in 2014 in Budapest. And she's a Tutashna. She completed her MA in Anthropology here at the University of Alberta. Uh, her paper on sex work in Ukraine recently won a prize from the Women's Network of the Canadian Anthropology Society. Uh, the title of her presentation is Candy Bars and Human Trafficking, Ukrainian Sex Workers' Narratives of Work and Migration. And I would just add that uh, it's interesting that Canada has a certain, has played a certain <laughs> role in uh, drawing awareness to the plight of Ukrainian women drawn into the sex trade uh, for various reasons. Victor Malarik, of course, has written a couple of books about this. Uh, we also take great pride in the fact that Larissa Kondratska made a movie called The Whistleblower, which tells the story of Ukrainian women drawn into uh, the, the, the trade in uh, uh, war-torn uh, Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, our own institute here in 2014 held a uh, seminar, uh, held a symposium uh, featuring Katya Lebchenko talking about, and the topic was trafficking in women. So this is not a subject that is unknown to us, but I'm sure that uh, Daphne is going to shed some new light on, on it with uh, her presentation today. Thank you. And I wanted to thank um, the University of Alberta and Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies for having me here, for organizing this beautiful event on such a beautiful snowy evening. And I hope not to bore you with my lecture. And I'm not the most um, accomplished and the most um, uh, talented public speaker, so please forgive me for my um, occasional mistakes and forgive me for my occasional... Like, looking into my notes. I just, I'm a person who tries to be like prepared so I can, I come usually with a stack of notes. Um, and I wanted to start my talk um, with mentioning that quite often um, when I tell people that I study sex work in Ukraine, they ask me questions that are usually not really related to the question of sex work, but more to the issue of human trafficking. And for instance, once um, I was asked whether it is true that in the, 1990, in the 1990s women were stolen from the streets of Kiev and sold into sexual slavery. And though during my research I have never encountered stories like this, um, such stories nevertheless proliferate both in Ukraine and abroad. And in order to address this issue, I decided to focus in this talk um, on the topic of human trafficking in Ukraine on, a, on the discourse of human trafficking as um, internationally and in Ukraine. And um, I also wanted to relate how the discourse of human trafficking is seen by my, by my participants, Kropovnitsky and Kvavirich, uh, sex workers in Ukraine. And most women whom I talked to, they, um, they went abroad for sex work in the 1990s and early 2000s. And so in this talk, I will try to relate their experiences of international migration for sex work. And I will also try to connect it to the discourse of human trafficking that is frequently used as an overarching framework to understand international sex work. And I guess that for scholars of post-socialist region, it is an open secret that the first decade that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union was characterized by uh, high unemployment rates, drastically reduced welfare, expansion of cross-border trade, and an increase in various illegal activities. And unsurprisingly, of course, such changes, they also affected the sphere of gender politics. And for, for instance, Susan Gall and Gail Kligman are uh, writing about the gender regimes of state socialism. They mentioned that men have become overly reliant on the state, 
and thus they felt quite frustrated and defeated after the state collapsed. However, they say women uh, were used during state socialism to juggle multiple responsibilities simultaneously because state socialism encouraged them to be not only productive, working citizen and a politically engaged uh, person at the same time, but they were also like, urged to uh, be mothers and wives and just beautiful women at, all at the same time. So they were like, kind of like more used to juggling these multiple tasks and responsibilities. Thus, in the times of crisis, write Gall and Kligman, women found it easier than men to adapt to economic changes and to supplement their main income by engaging into various other economic activities. And also, it is not maybe surprising that women were those people who found it easier to leave their hometown or their home country in order to engage into economic activity abroad. And for instance, it is quite known that shuttle trade was a very important phenomenon for that time. Shuttle trade is usually referred to in Russian as Chilnochnaya Targovlia, or in Turkish it is known as Bavulju. And Olga Sosunkevich, a scholar who studied shuttle trade, she also mentions that shuttle trade was heavily gendered, so way more women were doing it than men. And also along with the shuttle trade, um, women also, of course, dominated the expanding um, sphere of cross-border cross sex industry. But of course, I, I don't want to suggest that sex work was totally absent under state socialism, is socialism, it's just we don't know a lot about this issue. And according to Gallen Kligman, uh, the increase in prostitution and other sexual services after the fall of state socialism was most probably inspired by the same structural, structural patterns like lack of money. And so women, they started to take on part-time activities in addition to their main job. And however, uh, women, di or women did not only engage in sex work on a part-time basis in their hometowns and countries. A number of them also relocated to other places in order to do sex work. And for women from Kropovnitsky and Kravirich, such as my participants, uh, their main destinations were Moscow, Istanbul, and Czech Republic. However, the sheer number of women from post-socialist countries who started working in the sex industry, uh, both abroad and at home, it kind of soon led to an international discussion and soon to, an in to the international panic about the issue of human trafficking. And assessing the situation with human trafficking in the mid uh, to south end, Gail Kligman and Stephanie Lomancelli note that the restructuring of the labor market and social inequalities has affected the population differently depending on gender, race, nationality, citizenship and age. They emphasize that poverty, urban and especially rural poverty, is a consistent factor historically and comparatively that can be used like, to determine the likelihood whether a woman will engage into the sex industry. And also they, um, like, uh, looking at these sending countries, they say that there appears to be a correlation between national poverty rates and sending countries. And um, Kligman and Limoncelli build on the World Bank data and the UN data, and they identify Ukraine along with Moldova as one of the main source countries like, uh, of people, of women who go abroad in order to work as sex workers. And Klickman and Limoncello's brief assessment of Ukraine's place within the system of trafficking is also corroborated by the data from International Organization for Migration. And according to International Organization for Migration, in 2004 and 2006, more than 80% of trafficked persons from Ukraine were women, and out of all cases of trafficking, and the organization recorded more than 1,500 cases for the years, in 65% of them, people were trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. In comparison, the second major cause for trafficking, forced labor, was responsible only for half as, for half as few cases. However, it is also important to note that despite this firm reputation of Ukraine abroad as the brothel of Europe and its reputation as a source country of trafficked women, the number of trafficked persons has been steadily declining. And in 2000, basically 2010 was also the first year when the cases of trafficking for the purpose of forced labor outnumbered the cases for the purpose of sexual exploitation. And since 2010, like in percentile, there have been much more cases of trafficking for forced labor than for sexual exploitation. And also, for instance, 2017, um, in 2017, forced labor accounted for 88% of all cases of trafficking, 
and sexual exploitation accounted only for 7.6% of all cases. So the tendency is more or less clear, I guess. Observing the trends recorded by International Organization for Migration, scholar Ramona Vijayarasa notes that Ukraine often stands out from other source countries because of the large numbers that are reported by the country itself. Um, however, however Vijayarasa encourages us to take these numbers with a pinch of salt because these large numbers are partly due to the discrepancies in the definition of trafficking that can be found in the UN trafficking protocol and um, in the definition that is adopted in Ukraine, in the Ukrainian domestic law. And Vijayarasa writes that if these differences are reconciled, then Ukraine will definitely lose its status as a country with one of the highest numbers of trafficked persons in the world. And the discourse of human trafficking is, of course, not really new. The roots of international panic regarding um, trafficking women can be dated back to the late 19th century, when such inventions like telegraph, steam engine, and railroad appeared and facilitated the movement of people across countries and across borders. And at that time, for instance, researchers know that l relatively large number of women from then it was Russian Empire left for South America, Asia, uh, the Ottoman Empire, India and Manchuria. And quite often these women, they worked in their destination countries in the entertainment industry. They worked as circus workers, they worked as dancers and also they worked as prostitutes. And for example, Don Nagai notes that at the beginning of the 20th century in the major cities in Latin America, cities like Buenos Aires, for instance, brothels were usually flooded with workers from the territories of modern-day Ukraine and Russia. The migration of women from Europe to Latin America and to Asia, of course, hasn't been left unnoticed by the activists for the so-called social purity. And the ideas of social purity had a fairly clear uh, racial and religious dimension, since the cornerstone of the social purity movement was policing interracial and, entra and extramarital sex. Thus, uh, in their efforts to curb prostitution and interracial sex, supporters of the social purity movement launched a campaign against so-called white slavery. And even though there existed no clear definition at what, on what constitutes white slavery, it was in part this high to digest idea of white women having, vol having even voluntarily sex with non-white, non-European non men that fueled this campaign. And in order to garner public support of, in efforts to curb white slavery, uh, the supporters of the campaign, they resorted to creating a new image of the prostitute. They created an image of the victim prostitute. And it is important to note here that um, at the time in the 19th century, prostitutes were usually seen as, de as deviants and also as vectors of sexually transmitted diseases. So various countries, they tried to regulate prostitution. They were creating like lists of women who were suspected uh, to be prostitutes and they were subjecting these women to regular medical exams. But as you can imagine, the image of a deviant and image of a vector of sexually transmitted disease, diseases will garner one uh, very little sympathy. So this, the supporters of this movement, they um, started to create this image of a victim prostitute. So they were um, emphasizing the whiteness of the prostitute, her young age, her innocence and her vir virginity before she was sold into prostitution, of course. And the image of this naive, young, innocent woman who is reluctant to work as a prostitute uh, was also supplemented by an image of a vile pimp who, in the imagination of the proponents of the social purity movement, was almost, was almost always a non-white, a non-European male who deceitfully or forcefully draws women into prostitution. And in this way, the fighters for social purity movement, they willingly or unwillingly reduced a very complex social issue to a rather melodramatic dichotomy of a naive vi victim and a vile perpetrator. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> this international panic and outcry regarding human trafficking um, regarding white slavery, it slowly faded away at, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century with the beginning of the First World War. However, these images of naive victim and wild perpetrator were not forgotten. And they, um, as many scholars argue, found their new uh, incarnation 
in the panic of regarding human trafficking that um, can be dated uh, that can be dated from the 1980s, one international NGO started to worry about the alleged mass exodus of women from Latin America and after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union from Eastern Europe, who were allegedly sold to the brothels of the West. Um, and since the fall of the USSR, I guess it's fair to say that the gaze of the international community that is um, worried about human trafficking is firmly focused on the um, space of Eastern Europe. And apart from the dichotomy of uh, good versus bad, the discourse of human trafficking has also like a host of another shortcomings. One of the main discontents that scholars usually mention is the fact that this discourse lumps together uh, people who have very different intentions. For instance, Joanna Busha uh, warns of the danger of, of oversimplifying women's realities and choices when the differences between those who enter the situation of exploitation knowingly and those who were forced into this, situations, in, into this situation are blurred or discounted. And she also notes that ensuing anti-trafficking campaigns rarely benefit women in sex industry, for whom anti-trafficking efforts quite often result into additional spendings, for instance, in order to bribe the law enforcement officials. And then these additional spendings result into extended vulnerability and extended precarity, because in order to account for these additional spendings, um, women in the sex industry, they may agree quite often to work with the clients, for instance, who refuse to use condoms, condoms and otherwise they would never agree to work with these clients. And studying global migration, service industry, and the so-called industry of help that is available to the uh, victims of trafficking. Lord Augustine uh, notes that the discourse of trafficking always assumes that trafficked migrants are always already passive victims. And instead, she proposes to acknowledge that there is more than one form of autonomy and that instead of regarding trafficking, trafficked migrants as victims, we can just... Um, try to see them as flexible laborers, as ordinary human beings working to overcome specific problems. And similarly, like on the same note, Kimberly Hong, who studied uh, sex work in contemporary Vietnam. She's quite honest in her ethnography that before arriving to her field, before arriving to Ho Chi Minh City, and before establishing contacts with local sex workers, she was really keen on studying human trafficking and victims of trafficking. However, as she found out during her research, uh, nobody from the sex workers that she talked to uh, were trafficked into this industry. Instead, they uh, chose it over some other activities. For instance, she even found out that nearly all women in the niche that catered to Western men who traveled on budget were former factory workers and workers of the service industry who left those jobs in order to work in the sex industry because they viewed factory work and service industry as being far more exploitative than sex work. However, Kimberly Hong notes, such an attitude among sex workers was irrelevant to local NGOs and rehabilitation centers that routinely performed rescue operations. And she notes that Vietnam committed itself as a country to counteracting human trafficking and prior to its entry to the World Trade Organization. And so to demonstrate compliance with its um, adopted policies and to demonstrate like compliance with the Victim Protection Act and to appeal to potential investors from the Western countries, uh, Vietnamese NGOs started to perform rescue operations in order to reintegrate trafficked, trafficked victim, victims back into the society. However, they often ended up rescuing women who entered the sphere of sex uh, industry willingly. And um, because in the Vietnam legislation, if you're a sex worker, you can either be a victim of trafficking or you can be a criminal who engages in the illicit sex for money exchange. Um, people who were rescued by these NGOs, they quite often capitulated um, uh, very fast and they agreed to be classified as victims of trafficking just in order to escape this being just in order to escape the situation when they are labeled as criminals and also to avoid the eight months detention in the special center. So the rigidity of local legal categories, writes Kimberly Hong, 
And the reluctance to acknowledge the heterogeneity of sex work led to no-win situations when all the, for all the parties, for the state, for women who entered uh, sex industry knowingly and willingly, and also for actual trafficked victims who required actual help. And when I was in the field, the topic of cross-border sex work quite often surfaced in the informal conversation, but also it was quite apparent in many formal interviews that I recorded. And overall, my participants' memories of doing sex work in the 1990s were permitted with references to violence, rampant poverty, internal or international migration, and of course, trafficking. And out of all sex workers that I talked to, only one woman, um, let's call her Agatha, she had a direct experience of um, trafficking. Agatha uh, went to Moscow with her boyfriend, they checked into the hotel, then they went to their room and they fell asleep. However, when um, Agatha woke up, she found out that her boyfriend disappeared. And as she uh, then learned, her boyfriend was not really her boyfriend, but, she, but uh, he received a certain sum of money in order to bring her to Moscow. And um, Agatha then, she had to work in order to pay back that money that he received. She was reluctant to work as a sex worker, but she didn't really have any other choice. However, somehow she managed to call her parents and in a few weeks her parents get a hold of her and um, um, took her back to Ukraine with them. And um, according to Agatha, her boyfriend then received some jail time for that. Um, he was punished and she went back to Ukraine and she didn't work as a sex worker after that. And um, still, it was interesting for me that I, uh, I met Agatha when I was working with a local organization that, that was fighting for sex workers' rights. So I asked Agatha why she joined the organization for sex workers' rights. And Agatha told me that, um, I quote, the cases like mine are isolated occurrences. In general, this, meaning sex work, is work. While I was there, I talked to other girls that they were there willingly and they knew where they were going to and why. Agatha claimed that they knew what they were uh, going for and why is quite in line with many other narratives that I heard from my participants who went abroad for sex work in the 1990s and early 2000s. For instance, Zhenya became a sex worker a few months before her 18th birthday. At first she was a usual working girl, but uh, then quite soon she became a madam in a small local brothel. According to Zhenya, she had good patrons from bandits, whom she, ironically enough, met uh, during a Subotnik at the police station. Subotnik from Subota, <laughs> meaning Saturday. Well, Subotnik means unpaid obligatory work that um, police requires one to do in exchange for some kind of, in exchange for something like patronage. And however, in the case of sex workers, it's not usually physical, usual physical labor that one has to do, but it more means like offering sexual services um, at the police officer's convenience. And the tradition of Subotniki originated in the early Soviet Russia, where Subotnik originally meant free labor performed at leisure time for the benefit of society. However, as Odinokova writes, by late Soviet time, time it was regarded as an, as an inevitable and unpleasant duty. And Jenny recounted that these bandits offered her the role of a madame and she decided to grasp the opportunity. The bandits, the patrons received 50% of share and the other 50% of share were divided between Jenya and other girls. However, in some time, as she told me, her patrons ran into some troubles and she had to go to Moscow in order to avoid troubles herself. Though she was reluctant to recount the exact details of what the troubles were about, she still mentioned that she is still good friends with one of her patrons. And after working in Moscow for two and a half years, Zhenya then went to Czech Republic for a year before coming back to Ukraine. Marta's story is quite different from Zhenya. In 1995, um, after giving birth to a child, Marta needed money in order to support herself, her child and her family. And according to her, at the time, the whole city of Kroviri was flooded with advertisements saying that girls are needed to work in Moscow. And according to Martha, at the time, all these, adver ad all these ads uh, listed the amount of money that you will receive for this job in dollars. She also said that 
Well, the ads weren't really clear about the type of the work that you're supposed to perform, but still she says everybody was really clear on the subject of what will be required of you. So she said that she called the number listed on such an ad and in some time she was already in Moscow in two bedroom, apart in two bedroom apartment with two, do with two dozen other girls. Her passport was taken by a pimp and Martha was told that she had to pay back quite a sum of money. I quote. For travel, it was about $100. Then we had to give another $100 to a woman who printed the ad and found us. And the remaining, th the remaining $300 we had to pay for an apartment. And as long as we owe this $500, we don't get to have our documents or the money from clients. She was able to pay back the money in one month. After that, she had 30% uh, of share from each client and the remaining 70% the remaining went to the madame. Um, Martha worked in Moscow for 10 years and she diligently sent money back um, to her family and her son. And she even visited them from time to time bringing gifts and more money. During that 10 years, Martha changed a couple of pimps and madams before she, finally she and other girls, as she says, as she said, opened a massage parlor. When I asked her why and how she decided to quit sex work, Martha, to Martha told me that she became bored with it and she decided to go, ho to go home because of, a ho because of some reason. Firstly, her son was growing up, she was getting older and she wanted stability in her life. And then she broke up with a client with whom she was living as a concubine and um, she bought a ticket home. According to her, it was really difficult to find a job back in, in her home city and she was working like the lowest paying jobs and she thought of going back into sex work, but she didn't because she was a little bit afraid that her relatives will learn about it. And Martha was very upfront about the fact that she doesn't consider herself to be a victim of trafficking, even despite the very hard and exploitative conditions that she had to endure during her first years in Moscow. She said that she went there willingly and she knew what job she would be doing. Martha also told me now that to her knowledge, the situation um, of sex workers who go abroad now is very different from what it was in the mid nineties. I quote, my friend went to Turkey for the job. She called me and asked me to go with her, but I was already in love here with one guy, so I didn't go. It was around five or eight years ago. She showed me the contract with the woman that was sending her to Turkey, and it was written in the contract that such and such person agrees to pay another person, first name, last name, a certain sum of money. It doesn't specify the reason for payment, but the contract is then sealed by the lawyer. And she, her friend, went there, did the job, came back, oh well, she was deported. But she came so happy and content, she brought a lot of jewelry from there. So everything was good, she wants to go there again. Though sex workers' relationships with those who help them cross borders and arrange, and arrange for them like the place of work in their country of destinations might be more formalized now than they definitely used to be um, during the 1990s, um, it was certainly not the case for many of my participants. For instance, Asia went to Moscow during the Perestroika times. Her father became addicted to alcohol during the time and her mother wasn't, pay, wasn't paid her salary many months in the uh, row. And also then um, Asia had a, a younger brother for whom she had to look after. And um, at first she started to work as a sex worker in her hometown, but um, her hometown was rather small. It was difficult to keep her identity anonymous. So when she got an offer to go to Moscow, she willingly agreed because it was a bigger and a richer city. So the possibility of earning better money and not having to disclose one's identity, not having like fears of disclosing one's identity was very alluring. Though Asia worked in Moscow for only a few years, she admits to like it and that it was a pity to come back, especially given that the reason that she had to come back was uh, the fact that her father was becoming uh, progressively violent. And after coming back to her hometown, Asia was working on the international bus road as a conductor. And from time to time, she was having sex for money with the bus driver because ac according to her, every penny mattered. Uh, what is interesting is that she also doesn't consider her case to be the case of human trafficking because, as she narrated, she agreed to go there for sex work voluntarily. Natalia, 
was also very upfront about her experience of sex work and was adamant about being a victim of trafficking. She started to engage in sex work from time to time from the age of 16. I quote, it was the, the, it was the time of disintegration of the Soviet Union, of unemployment and other things. And again, I come from a single parent family. I was raised only by my mother, and the collapse of the Soviet Union led to my mother, a person with three graduate degrees, working at a foundry and earning money by working a shovel. And for her self-esteem it was, it was, she started to drink, she became addicted, and we had no money. Together, together with her friend, Natalia started to frequent different bars and cafes, and uh, she started hooking up with different men who could provide some money in exchange or even some food. I quote, sometimes the clients gave us money, sometimes didn't, but sometimes we were able to hustle them for something. Yes, I remember these vending stalls full of bounty sneakers and Mars, and we would drive to them and he would say, choose, and we wouldn't know one to, what to choose. And he would say, take them all, and we would take one of each chocolate bars from the showcase. It was chic for us. Мы так шиковали. Natalia's experience of these chocolate bars that are probably quite, some, quite usual for an average Westerner as something chic is reminiscent of what Jennifer Patico called uh, consuming the West but becoming third world. And that was also docu documented by other scholars of early post-socialism. Mm -hmm. This overexposure to novelties and to new bright goods imported from Western countries projected the feeling of backwardness of post-socialism countries and thus uh, also produced the desire of trying to catch up and to live as glamorously as one presumably lived in the West. In some time, in some time Natalia also received an offer to go to Moscow and she agreed. She spent there 10 years in total and most of the time she was there working as a sex worker for different pimps. When she decided to come back um, to Ukraine, she faced the problem of not having her documents with her. So she just bribed the border officers who were responsible for checking the documents and then in exchange for a small sum of money they turned the blind eye uh, to her not having her documents. According to Natalia, however, it isn't an out of an it isn't an out of ordinary situation when a sex worker wants to come back from abroad but doesn't have her passport. She says that she has known quite a few other girls who faced this situation at that time. And also she learned of many more situations like that when she became an activist for sex workers' rights. Natalia told me that the easiest way to solve this problem for a sex worker, the problem of not having documents but wanting to come back, was to go to an NGO that was engaged in anti-trafficking activities and to tell them that you're a victim of trafficking without documents and that you want to go home. As a rule, this organization will provide you with a temporary documents and a ticket home. Thus, Quite some sex workers started to use this trick in order to get home without having to pay for a ticket and for a bribe to the border patrol officer. According to Natalia, the, victims of, uh, the number of the victims of trafficking from Ukraine that are often presented by the Ukrainian government or even by the international NGOs are very exaggerated. In part because they include these sex workers who pretended to be victims of trafficking in order to have a ticket back home. So that it's like sex workers in Kimberly Hoang study who agreed to become victim of victims of trafficking in order to be in order to escape being classified as criminals and detained for eight months. Sex workers from Ukraine were quite often making use of the status of victim in order to solve their financial problems. Indeed, it is incredibly difficult to accurately estimate the number of victims of trafficking. For instance, in 2001, USAID released a re report stating that approximately from um, seven, 700,000 to 4 million people are trafficked annually. Unfortunately, the organization didn't offer any explanation on the methodology that they used to collect this data. And also in a few years, the same organization, USAID, they released another report where they mentioned a significantly smaller figure. They mentioned that from 600,000 to 800,000 people are trafficked annually and 800,000 and 4 million are very different figures. Similarly, the Global Su Survival Network in one of its reports presented the number of sex workers from Eastern Europe working in the 
Western Europe as the number of victims of trafficking from Eastern Europe. Such incidents led many scholars um, of sex industry, many scholars of human trafficking, to be profoundly uneasy with the reports that are released by these big international organizations, since as a rule, the definition of human trafficking is not really clearly stated there, and also the methodology of collecting the data is not stated explicitly. Russian speakers uh, often refer to the period of 1990s as Lihi Divanosti or the Rowdy 90s, implying that it was a very rough period for many and that this period was characterized by constant lack of money, unemployment, spike in criminal activities and the possibilities of rapid social mobility, especially if joining the criminal world. Lihi Divanosti is supposed to be an eloquent and exhaustive term for the state of affairs of post-socialist space in the first decade that followed the collapse of the, state, uh, of the USSR. Faced with this state of insecurity, people resorted to violent entrepreneurship, cross-border trade, labor migration, including migration for sex work. And the latter trend in turn caused an international concern regarding the question of human trafficking, especially for the purpose of sexual exploitation. All these proliferating uh, anti-trafficking discourses and organizations, however, are not as effective in combating trafficking as it was hoped for. Moreover, the discourse of human trafficking often lumps together into the same category women who enter sex trade with very different motivations for very different uh, reasons. And also this discourse usually operates within the binary of a victim of trafficking versus a criminal who is willingly selling sex and thus violates the laws. And because of this, quite often these structural issues like unemployment, poverty are blurred and pushed into the background, being overshadowed by an emphasis on an individual and their agency or lack of such. And as many scholars argue, this dichotomy tends to silence the existence of global inequalities of the world system that reproduce the very need for survival strategies like migration, sex work, and ultimately cross-border sex work. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't bore you to death. We have time for questions. Dr. thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a very brief question. To what extent uh, non-fiction work by Victor Molarek de Natasha's uh, was uh, essential for your study and in general like Victor Molarek's uh, investigative journalism? Thanks. Um, because he touches the yeah. problems of traffic in, in Eastern Europe. Yeah, the Natasha's trade is one of the, I guess, like one of the most known works in, in this sphere. And yeah, I've read that. Um, I applaud his desire to talk about this issue because it is a very important issue. However, I am often skeptical of the tone and of the form that he and a lot of other people talk about it because they sometimes focus on the separate stories of Masha's, Natasha's, Vera's and uh, things like that. And they often tend to present it in a very sensationalist way. And we often empathize with those people, but we don't quite often learn about the structural issue. And th this is my beef with some of this work that doesn't diminish its importance, though. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the number of uh, trafficking decreased and like more people like uh, including the category of forced labor. Uh, does it tell something about social process or rather changes in methodology how the data was collected? What like the change of numbers tell us? Because you expressed some you know, skepticism about it, like how it's done, but you can see numbers are changing. Are they telling us something or not? That is a really good question. And from what I know, the methodology of the International Organization for Migration didn't change. So I would deduce that it more tells us about the social processes that are happening, but never hurts to look into that deeper. Um, there was a lot of uh, information that came out about uh, orphanages in Ukraine, which were being used for grooming uh, potential prostitutes. Is that still happening? And secondly, did you do any work on um, 
punishment that may be meted out to people that traffic and uh, submit women to uh, forcing them to work as prostitutes. Is there any studies along those lines as to what type of penalties are imposed on them? Um, I will touch on the orphanages first and then on the um, people who force who force other people into this industry. To be honest, that's not orphanages are not quite my sphere of expertise. I know that people started talking about it after Mikhail Slavoshpitsky film, right? Uh, but um, I don't really know, and I mean, I don't like to speculate about what I don't know. So just sorry. And regarding the uh, perpetrators of human trafficking, right? Uh, in the Ukrainian legislation, if a person is convicted of human trafficking, they get um, up to 25 years of imprisonment. Um, however, I didn't really focus on that. Um, this is a part of my master's thesis, and in my master's thesis, I focused more on the narratives of sex workers themselves. However, I will just mention that this uh, question of who gets punished for human trafficking, it's an incredibly complex question because I have known of um, situations when charges in human trafficking uh, were being like filed against sex workers themselves because some police officers, they had a beef with some sex workers and so it just all got that like snowballed and one person sh she wasn't a human trafficker she was a street sex worker she was drug addicted but she was then charged with human trafficking though she was not really a perpetrator so it's just but that's an incredibly interesting and important issue to explore you haven't done work on that but is anybody doing any work on the issue of punishment and whether it has a deterrence and um, I know that there has been a work by Elizabeth Bernstein. She studies like human trafficking in general, and uh, I'm in the process of reading her last book, but sh so she might have some of the answers. Other than that, I don't really know. I don't think that there are like a lot of work on that, to be honest. <coughs> Back there. Uh, can you speak to the effects of the, the more recent developments, such as the signing of the visa-free travel agreement uh, in 2017, or the liberalization of work permit issuance in Poland, uh, something within the last five years. Uh, do you mean whether it has affected sex industry? Yes, I mean, because we see a lot of changes in how people migrate and where they work, uh, and uh, what implications are there for the cross-border sex industry and human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Well, I would definitely, uh, I would estimate that maybe the number of women working in Europe increased. But uh, to be honest, I haven't focused on that. And I don't know other people who have focused on that. And somehow just nobody wants to study sex work in Ukraine. Nobody wants to study sex trafficking in Ukraine. So we don't have like a lot of information on that. However, I will just mention that it is very interesting that Western Europe is not always one of the main points of destination. Somehow much more women are much more likely to go to Moscow. They are much more likely to go to Istanbul. And there is a beautiful ethnography about that um, written by Alexia Bloch. And there are still a lot of Eastern Europeans women in Western Europeans brothel, but brothels. And maybe the number of women have gone up lately because as you rightly mentioned, there have been some changes in the political arena, but I, all I can offer you right now are just like my estimations. Do you think the Moscow and Istanbul have been such prominent destinations because of the visa control in the West? Mm, yes and no. Uh, with Istanbul, there was a situation that a lot of women were entering uh, with that like entertain entertainer visa and they were working in strip clubs like exotic dancers, but Turkey has closed that visa categories five or seven years ago, if I'm not mistaken, responding to the issues of human trafficking. However, it didn't really deter people of going there. And from what I know, uh, 
a lot of women go there not uh, not only because it's relatively easy to get there in in regard with visas, but also because there is like much more uh, like the market is really bigger, and also there is this like myth of Eastern European femininity and Eastern European femininity sometimes hypersexualized in that area area. So it sells quite well. Uh, in uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, I was going to Lugansk on business trips in the airport. I saw myself a couple of times in the same situation. Ukrainian girls, they were from Eastern Ukraine, probably the same could be from Western Ukraine. There were guys coming to them <coughs> from all over the world. Sometimes they were like, from certain countries, like there. They were meeting in the airports. Did you consider this situation where they, the girls from Ukraine, in regional cities and even in small district cities, sometimes in smaller villages. They develop a whole network of working with the whole world, like sending information to the guys in Canada, US and everywhere. These guys responded, sometimes rich guys. They went to Ukraine, sometimes they paid these girls and so on and so forth. And they organized also a movement here, websites, catching these girls, because these girls were really active, like involving too many guys mm -hmm. who were going to Ukraine. Sometimes they were beaten severely and so on and so forth. To what extent they can be considered like victims? To what extent they can be considered like perpetrators and organizers of big scheme, like, you know, because it was huge, like, too many regional centers were organizing it. And like I said, even district centers, in all over Ukraine, the network was organized. <clears throat> can I can you just like clarify for me the second part of your question? To what extent they are like uh, victims and they are like organizers of this scheme? But them, you mean like women who work for these agencies? Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, these girls, yeah, because they themselves sometimes they have computer guys who are sending these letters, but later they are like inviting these guys <coughs> to come or send money all the time for sick mom, for sick mm -hmm. kid, for her needs, and constantly, you know, and these guys are involved like, from Canada and US. Yeah, there is a huge industry in Ukraine that there are like many agencies that attract men from all over the world. Just go to wife.in.ua and you will see all for yourselves. And so there are like a lot of agencies they are proliferating just you can walk on the streets of Kiev and you will see all those advertisements with your own eyes and just that website was just like one that like really stuck in my head maybe it was the the aim of those who who produced this advertisement as to the second part of your question whether these women can be considered victims of trafficking or not to be honest i don't re I don't always like talking about we talking about people in the sex and industry as a victim of trafficking, because again it obscures a lot of structural issues and it focuses on like okay so like are you a victim or are you not victim, and why should we focus on victimizing them or not? But just maybe we can try to reframe the discussion and talk about it. Okay, like so why are you choosing this sphere? Are there any alternatives available to you? If not, just maybe we can start the maybe we can start the discussion here, and well, I guess that, yeah, I guess that is. Did did any of the um, women sex workers you talked to also work in the porn industry? Uh, no, because I worked with street sex workers, and people who work in the porn they're usually kind of like more high up, more elite because uh, people who work on the street, they're usually drug addicted. Some of them, they have problems with alcohol, so they are not type of women who would be cast into porn movies. And did, did uh, you encounter me, because it was in the 90s, I remember seeing newspaper reports that Ukrainian women were working as strippers in clubs of all across Canada. Did, did, you, did you talk with anybody who was involved in that? Because some of them also were engaged in prostitution as well on the side. Um, most of uh, the women that I talked to, they didn't manage to go as far as Canada. So I guess Czech Republic was like the westernmost point and like Moscow was like the easternmost point. And not in Amsterdam, because I remember also you were saying that oh, all these Ukrainian women were in the <coughs> sex uh, industry. No, no. 
Um, but I would again hypothesize that it is due um, to the fact that uh, women who go further west, to go to, uh, who go further to Amsterdam, they have maybe less drug problem, fewer drug problems, maybe fewer like alcohol problems, and maybe they come not from like such a lower um, socioeconomic background. Maybe just there's something. There is the, the answer is in their like socioeconomic background because sex work is not a homogeneous uh, industry. It's highly heterogeneous. There are like its own hierarchies and. I work basically with like the lowest strata of sex workers, people who work on the highways. Yes. Question about the narratives themselves. Uh, does feminism in any in any form come out in those narratives? And does nationalism and local identity come up in those narratives? You mean in na narratives of sex workers? Yeah, about their work and mm -hmm. we got into this industry? Um, I can say that they might not use the word feminist, but sometimes uh, we can classify them as such. Um, however, some of them, they're reluctant to be identified as feminist because, well, in Ukraine, there are still some negative connotations attached to this word. And also a lot of people, they don't, they are not quite I don't know how to put it politically literate when it comes like to different uh, like to different uh, to different ideas but those who are not working as sex workers anymore but kind of like moved to the sex worker activism they i guess are more likely to talk about themselves as um being feminists uh, regarding national uh, national identity and local identity well, they most often talk about themselves th themselves in terms of citizenship. So the category of citizenship and, I don't know, the, ca the category of class was more prominent for them than some of the national or even, I don't know, like local, like oblast level identifiers. Just a quick follow up. If we put uh, the label of feminism aside, uh, like women's emancipation, this kind of narratives, uh, and seeing sex work as a form of this emancipation in any way, do those ideas present? Are those ideas present? Yes, yes. Generally, a lot of like feminist ideas, are, feminist ideas are present in there. For instance, they are, are talking about equal pay. They're talking, the issue of childcare is incredibly important because um, most, if not all, of sex workers, they have at least one child and, well, you have to feed your child and childcare is not always accessible for them. And also sex work, seeing, arguing for sex work as a legitimate activity is a huge issue for many of them and they want to fight back against many different taboos surrounding sex and they definitely want to try to affirm it as well it's something that an empowered woman can do. Uh, Jessica? Um, just wanted to build on earlier discussion about sort of the Ponzi schemes or you know, the counterintuitive aspects of the pimp can also be considered in terms of the fact that actually a lot of women become pimps because they tend to be more trusted by other women. And there's a really interesting NGO in San Francisco who, that works well on this issue and specifically on, on the counterintuitive mm -hmm. gendered aspect. It could be also interesting to um, integrate into your study uh, comparative aspects of policies in the U.S. and Canada as intake points. I know U the U.S. is a huge market for um, sex trafficking from around the world. Um, as you know, sex work and human trafficking are not mm -hmm. the same thing, as you mentioned, but there are some really great pro bono legal clinics working along the U.S. Canadian border, like the University of Michigan. Uh, that can be really useful sites to, to consult just to see how the countries are working together and handling this issue. Um, also, there's a book by a Canadian author from Montreal um, named Melinda Chaturva, mm -hmm. 
And in that book, she lays out some of these, these policies and these differences. And she also looks very much at a micro-geographical map of urban centers and police work and how a lot of um, sex work is really tied to, to how the city spaces are managed. Because oftentimes, if, as you mentioned, the lowest level sex workers are forced to work out in the street, the hustle in the street, if they're, especially a lot of, you know, African American women in the U.S. context, um, they tend to be targeted, race targeted, by the police and arrested first. So, so the the micro study could be also an interesting element to to add into your larger structural analysis within Ukraine, because I don't think that's ever been done before. I, I don't know if if there's any kind of um, intersection between urban studies and sex work that, that you've encountered in Ukraine, but that is an area mm -hmm. I'd love to learn more about. Thank you. I definitely agree with you, especially regarding to looking at the different entanglements of this issue on the international level, because the issue of sex work and human trafficking it's so complex that you can like disentangle it eternally and i definitely agree that you can just like take a certain like bounded space and to look how all these complex phenomena like is manifested in in this specific locality definitely thank you so much for this suggestion uh, winston yeah i found your talk really informative um it caused you know, I've got a simple question. It caused me to rethink so much of what I thought I knew about sex, sex work and sex workers. Uh, everything that, well, most of what we've read or heard about sex workers in Edmonton or Chicago or anywhere in the world would suggest that life for them is mostly na nasty, brutish, short. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a dark underside to mm -hmm. sex work that there isn't to factory work. And I agree, the same socioeconomic factors, you know, that would cause somebody to engage in factory work are likely the very same ones that would drive them into sex work. But in all the cases, you know, that you cited, you seem to sort of, uh, you know, imply that the life of the sex worker is fairly benign. All of your cases seem to suggest that. And, you know, it flies in the face of everything that, as I said, I thought I knew. I've studied industrial relations for quite a while, and, you know, you have all of these studies and all of these works. Was it your intention to put out the message that, in fact, the work of the sex workers is, is fairly nice, benign, desirable work? Surely not. Uh, my intention was to humanize these people. I, as an anthropologist, I see myself as a person who tries to put, to put a face and to humanize a big story. Um, it is interesting that it came out this way for you because I, when I was collecting those stories, I wouldn't definitely think of a work of a sex worker, especially when you're, I don't know, stalked with two thousand other girls in a two-bedroom apartment as benign. But I mean, there are definitely um, advantages and disadvantages to every sphere of activity, I guess. And for many of my uh, participants who now worked in Kropovnitsky and Krivirich as street sex workers, being able to work for themselves in their free time, being able to decide when they work and when they don't work, it, it mattered a lot, a lot for them. So, I mean, I don't want to suggest that sex work is easy money. There is this stereotype around sex work. It's not easy money. But I mean, when you're spending 12 hours working on a factory and it's, I don't know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the room when you work, I wouldn't call this condi that conditions benign as well. I just want to suggest that there is more complexity to sex work as a phenomenon itself, and also there is more complexity when we are trying to compare it with some other occupations. Both done. Uh, thank you for your talk. Could you just, uh, off the top of your head, because this wasn't in the text of your uh, presentation, uh, tell us uh, your impression of how Ukraine compares with other post-communist countries. In, so, in regard to this topic? In regard to sex work or cross-border sex work? Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, 
Um, especially, well, especially the uh, the trafficking and uh, and its connection to uh, uh, this, uh, this experience. Well, one can write a book answering that question of yours. Um, one day I intend to, but so far I will just say that um, I know that Ukraine and Moldova have been um, the most prominent source countries of women who go abroad. For women in Russia, it was much more easier to go to the big cities in Russia itself, though there has been also a lot of, uh, there have been, um, there, there has been this phenomenon when women from Russia also were going to Istanbul, which was a great market. Um, I don't know a lot about Belarus, for instance. To be honest, just I haven't ha I haven't encountered any good sources about sex work in Belarus. But also, we have I think the situation in Ukraine uh, maybe is maybe a little bit different from its neighboring countries. Uh, but um, I wouldn't attest to that because, I mean, you have to do like some comparison before making some kind of claim. I, I'm not the person who likes to, who likes to make claim without having any ground to them. Yes. Um, I just have a quick question about the cities that you chose for mm -hmm. your research. Why is it Kropovnitsky and Kravitsky? Is there a specific? Um, I had some contacts in Kropovnitsky, so it was just easier for me to pick up on those contacts. And uh, I mean, sex work, when you're studying street sex workers, you can't just show up on a highway, you know, so you kind of, yeah, you had to do some like preliminary establishing of contacts. So like it was easier for me. So that's why I chose Kropovnitsky and Kriviri, basically because some women from Kriviri, they came to visit people in Kropovnitsky, so it was kind of this snowballing sampling issue. And then the second question, uh, so in your research, the participants, did they start their sex work in 1990s? Is that the time period we're talking about? Or are there different age? Because it feels to me that the time mm -hmm. would matter, and Ukra Ukrainian situation right now would probably reflect differently. Oh, oh definitely. So I I, I talked to, uh, to a lot of different women of different ages. It's just like for the purposes of this talk, I focused more on the women who started uh, doing sex work in the 1990s and early 2000s. But uh, when I was uh, in the field, there were also like a lot of people who were my age and who uh, remember 1990s as children. And those people didn't have a lot of experience of cross-border sex trade. They were usually like working in different cities of, in Ukraine, which also tells us something about social dynamics, I guess. But yeah, definitely, I guess I should have clarified that. Thanks for pointing that out. John Paul. Yeah. Um, last time I was in Italy, I heard more Ukrainian spoken than I had heard in Kiev uh, the week previously. And, um, there's a lot of women in, K uh, in, in Italy, a lot of women in Portugal. They're often in caretaker positions, caring for old people or, or, or watching children. And I'm wondering, like, in the old literature about the sort of turn of the century white slave trade, uh, they said that the, much of the white slavery uh, followed the patterns of immigration. But from what you said, it sounds like that these Ukrainian uh, sex workers, they migrate rather to places that are not or, or don't seem to me to be normal places where Ukrainians go to work. Or is Istanbul and Moscow mm -hmm. and Amsterdam places where, where Ukrainians go? Are there many sex workers of Ukrainian origin, say in Portugal and Italy? Or is it just different, different kind of social migration? There are definitely Ukrainian sex workers in Italy and Portugal, but uh, from some of the reports that I have seen, and again, it is a very difficult, it's very difficult to come up with exact number because you have to trace these women. And also some people, they might work as sex workers, but they might not necessarily identify as sex work workers. So when they ask, so like, are you working as a, are you a sex worker? They might say no, but again, we, it all comes back to the issue of the issue of definition. Uh, but putting that aside, from uh, some of the reports from like five or six years ago, from one of the 
uh, Dutch organization that monitors uh, sex work in Europe. Um, there were a lot of sex workers in the Netherlands, but not so many in Portugal and Italy. But you're definitely right to point out that Portugal and Italy are famous destinations for Ukrainian women to work as caretakers, as badante, to take care of the children and after elderly people. From what you described, there are different levels of coercion involved in this trafficking. Uh, did you run across any cases of women fighting back? And do they know about Lorena Bobbitt? About what, sorry? Lorena Bobbitt. Oh, yes, of course. I mean, like, I know about Lorena Bobbitt, but I don't think that it's case this case is particularly prominent in Ukraine and I'm not sure that this is the way you go to fight for sex workers' rights. I mean, if you want to garner sympathy. Well, no, but if somebody's being coerced against their will, and there are some like that, do they fight back? Did you run across any that have fought back against the people that are coercing them? Oh, well, I mentioned the case of Agatha, whose uh, perpetrator, her fake boyfriend, was jailed after that. but. The case was that I didn't, I didn't find a lot of cases of trafficking like that, but um, I heard about some of the other cases. People try and people do fight. Back, the thing is that it's sometimes, it's sometimes difficult to kind of, you know, uh, make the, make, to start this, this process and to, I mean, uh, to end it in the way that the the ex, the exploited person would probably desire for it just it's a lot of hassle for many of them. It's probably not the scope of your research, but I just wonder if um, you have any idea about the possibility for the ex sex worker find any job if they decide, let's say, to have a different life and they come back to their city, is there, do you know of any cases like that? Like, is it even a possibility to have a different life where they grew up or maybe just in the country where they grew up? What would be next for them? Well, many of them definitely came back to Ukraine. They tried to find a job back in their hometown. Many of them were successful in finding the job. The problem was that the job didn't have any social benefits. Not that sex work had a lot of social benefits, but the job also didn't pay a lot of money. However, if you came back and you kind of dedicated yourself to like settling back and having this old life back, well, you kind of had to stick with it probably. It's just I didn't study this specifically, but some of these uh, stories, they occurred periodically. I wonder about the stigma, that whether it exists at all in Ukraine, you know, there is any rumors. There, are, there is a lot of stigma surrounding sex work, but that was the point for many of them to live and to work abroad, because then one didn't have to encounter the stigma. You can say that, like, you know, like I worked as a waitress for all these 10 years because, well, if you send back the money every month and there are like not so many connections in Istanbul or in Moscow, for instance, well, people will not really check who you work. So it was like easier to come back and not have like all those stigma attached to you. I just want to add that at the, around the turn of the century when I, I read statistics on prostitutes in Lviv and in Krakow. Well, the prostitutes in Krakow mainly came from eastern Galicia, and the prostitutes in, in uh, Lviv came from Krakow. So even then, <laughs> even then, it was, it was uh, people, of, you avoided the stigma by going to a different place. You have to send me that. Uh, I don't know if I, can, if I can find it now, but because I, I gave all my notes to Achilles, Father House, that all my notes on prostitution. <laughs> Well, uh, I just want to thank our speaker tonight, Dr. Clark, for a fascinating talk, I think, with uh, certainly a different point of view of looking at uh, this whole question of sex workers and sex trafficking. Uh, so thank you very much.